Hello everyone and welcome to Sips and Stories. My name is Elizabeth and in today's video I will be discussing my July wrap up. So once again I'm sorry for posting this video so late but I did read a number of really terrific books in July. Everything from classics to some amazing books for Jane Austen July. So if you'd like to skip ahead to Jane Austen July I will link a timestamp below. But otherwise grab your favorite beverage as we discuss these amazing books. The first book that I would like to discuss today is Animal Farm by George Orwell. I think if there's any moment in history to read Animal Farm, now would be that moment. And I have read previously 1984 several times. Um, I was a teacher. I had to teach 1984 a couple times. And just between you and me and the internet, it's really not my favorite book. Um, I just think it's very heavy handed. It just kind of slaps you across the face with all of the points it's trying to make. So always it's just never been my favorite book. And for that reason, I never went back and read Animal Farm. And that's kind of what this channel is about. It's just a chance for me to go back and read all the classics that I missed in school and connect with all of you out there that love classics as much as I do. And Animal Farm is just one of those books that I now is on my favorites list. It definitely was a five-star read for me. And I think reading it right now in this moment in history was the perfect time to read it. So if you aren't familiar with this book, it is basically an allegory about the Russian Revolution and authoritarian and totalitarian regimes and how they come into power. So it's about a group of animals who basically overthrow the farmers and take over the farm, animal farm. And at first things are going pretty well until the pigs rise to power and basically start suppressing all the other animals. It's absolutely fantastic. It probably is one of the funniest and most terrifying books that I have ever read. And I just absolutely loved it. I think now is the perfect time to read it. Just reading this and then watching the news. I mean, you just can't help making those connections about what's going on today. Um, I would ask all of you, I mean, do you feel more free today than you did a year and a half ago? I know I certainly don't. And I do think a lot of our leaders have used this pandemic as an opportunity to take control, to instill all these regulations and put out all these rules in society. I mean, just some of the things that are going on in places like New York right now, I am 100% against. And so, or George Orwell was talking about the Rev Russian Revolution. He was talking obviously about Stalin and Trotsky, but this doesn't just apply to the left. It applies to the right too. It applies to any group of people that try to suppress another group of people. And I loved it. I really liked it because it wasn't as heavy handed as 1984. I think a child of 11 or 12 could easily read and discuss this book, which is why I think it's so universal. I really think kids should start reading this in middle school and high school. But then if you're an adult like me and you've missed this book, go back and read it. Or maybe you haven't read it since high school. Now is a good time to reread it. It is so short. It's so easy. It's about 150 pages. My Signet Classic book is, but I highlighted the heck out of this, as you can see by all the book darts in here. I just thought it was so good. I especially loved when the pigs started kind of rewriting history and telling the animals, look, you're, you have more food now than you ever did with Farmer Jones. Um, animals like start to believe it. Obviously Boxer is just one of the most tragic characters in this book. And I think he really represents of what someone like Hitler called useful idiots. And yeah, just really, really good book. Um, I don't want to get too political on this channel, but now would be a good time to read Animal Farm because there are definitely a lot of pigs in power right now. And it's up to us to kind of put a stop to it. If you would like just something different about Animal Farm, just a different ex way to experience it, I really recommend this new graphic novel that just recently came out maybe a couple years ago, and that it is by adapted and illustrated by Odir, O-D-Y-R. Really good way to revisit the story or to introduce kids in the classroom to the story. Definitely go back and read George Orwell's language, but this one is really good. The illustrations, I just absolutely love the illustrations in here. Really neat. And I think it would be a perfect way for teachers to use this one in the classroom as well. So I don't wanna go too far into it and give away any spoilers, but 
this is just also a really nice way to experience Animal Farm as well. So yeah, I definitely think that nowadays are becoming very Orwellian and just perfect time to reread Animal Farm. Speaking of books with a great sense of humor, the next book that I read this month was Ants Aren't Gentlemen by P.G. Woodhouse. And P.G. Woodhouse is one of my all-time favorite authors. I think after Ellen Montgomery, P.G. Woodhouse is probably my favorite author just because I love his sense of humor so much. I think he is one of the best writers of the 20th century, one of the best writers really of all time um, in terms of his humor. I think what he did for the English language is very similar to someone like Shakespeare or Austin or Dickens. He just was revolutionary in terms of his writing. And he is probably the most famous comedic writer of all time. This is the last book in the Jeeves and Worcester series. So over the last few years, I have slowly been making my way through the Jeeves and Worcester series. And if you're new to Woodhouse, you do not have to read Jeeves and Worcester in any particular order or the Blanding series. I don't haven't read the Blandings yet, but I don't think you have to read them in any particular order as well. It's kind of like Agatha Christie. You can just kind of pick any one of these books at random and kind of get the gist. In fact, most of P.G. Woodhouse's plots in the Jeeves series are exactly the same. And this one is no different. Basically, Bertie Wooster, he gets entangled in some sort of love triangle with one of his old school chums. One of his aunts usually calls him over to the country to come solve some crisis. And then Jeeves ends up saving the day. So this one is no exception to that. It was really funny, just like Animal Farm, because this one deals with a lot of characters on the left um, who are socialists. And so at the beginning, he gets caught up in this uh, riot that's happening happening in London. So just P.G. Woodhouse's views on that are pretty interesting. And this is one of the last books that P.G. Woodhouse wrote in the Jeeves series. It was published, I believe, in 1974. And P.G. Woodhouse, I think, died in 1975. So I'm just going to say this is one of the last books that he wrote in his 90s. And that just blows my mind because his sense of humor is spot on. I mean, this is not as funny as some of his earlier books, but it's still there. He's still at tip top form in his 90s. And I can only hope that when I'm in my 90s that my sense of humor will still be intact just as much as P.G. Woodhouse. One can only hope. I love this book. And as always, I always give these books at least four out of five stars. One of the next books that I read this month was an absolute delight, and that is The Green Gage Summer by Rumor Godin. This is a folio edition, which is why it doesn't have a title on the front. The title is on the side. But I did mention this in my summer TBR video, so I will link that video below. And I loved this. This was one of my favorite books of the year so far. Five out of five stars, hands down. And this is one of the only few books that I have ever read that has come close to I Capture the Castle by Dodie Smith, which is one of my all time favorite books as well. And so I would just encourage people that are a fan of Dodie Smith and I Capture the Castle to go out and pick up this book immediately because I can just tell you, you're going to absolutely love it. It is about a group of English children who are on vacation in France with their mother and their mother unexpectedly gets ill and has to go to the hospital for several weeks. So the children are basically just running loose at this hotel in France in the countryside. So just running all over the hotel, running all over the countryside, just having the time of their lives. And the nature writing in this is incredible. The descriptions of the orchards and the rivers and the people in the community absolutely fantastic writing. It's also really fun to just see a hotel, what a hotel was like in France shortly after World War II. Very glamorous, but really weird at the same time. So I really love how the hotel's owner, Madame Zizi, she uses like all the bullet holes in the house as a way to entice American tourists as like, see, see what happened to us during World War II, how we suffered. Um, they also bury the skull in the backyard every day and they have the dogs uncover it like, oh, that's a World War II soldier that's buried in the backyard. So the sense of humor in this is absolutely hilarious. And it's mainly about the two oldest daughters, um, Cecil and Joss, and it's kind of their coming of age story. So at the hotel is a British citizen named Elliot, and he's very glamorous, very sophisticated. He's basically having an affair with the hotel's 
owner, Madam ZZ, but he also likes Joss too because Joss is coming of age, she's getting older, she's very beautiful, and so he starts falling for Joss and Joss starts falling for him. And meanwhile, so is Cecil. Cecil's falling for him as well. And so it's just a really great coming of age story. And that's what really reminds me of I Capture the Castle. I also really love the scenes where Elliot takes basically all the children on these trips throughout France to places like wineries where they make champagne and to all these fancy restaurants. And so the kids really experience like the good life for the first time. And so they're always like drinking champagne or after dinner, they're smoking cigarettes. It's just really great. So if you're a foodie and you like the good life, I think that's why I love this book so much. It's just all the descriptions of the food and the wine in this book. In fact, it's just really funny. All the kids in this book are hilarious. The youngest daughter, she gets adopted kind of by the hotel's French chef. And so she really becomes a foodie and she learns how to eat snails and frog's legs and caviar and things like that. And then the youngest brother is one of my favorite characters in this book. His name is Will Mouse and his ambition in life is to be a fashion designer. So he is just in his element at this hotel watching all of these glamorous women in all their dresses. So it's just a very unique and interesting book. There are also some sinister things happening at the hotel, so I don't wanna give away any spoilers, but fantastic book, amazing writing, and yeah, now I wanna go track down all of Rumor Groden's books because I loved this. I gave it five out of five stars. Switching Gears again is a book that I didn't really love as much as I thought I would, and that is The Penderwicks by Jeanne Birdsall. This one I also mentioned in my summer TBR, and I think the problem with this is I read it alongside the Green Gage Summer, and so the children in that book were so interesting. The writing in that book was so good, so poor Penderwicks did not even stand a chance. And in all fairness, this was a cute little summer book, a summer tale of four sisters, two rabbits, and a very interesting boy. It's about a group of four girls that live with their widower father, and they go on summer vacation in the Berkshires in Massachusetts. They stay on this cabin on this very fancy estate, and they meet this boy named Jeffrey, who is the son of the estate's owner. And so Jeffrey is like poor little rich boy, and he ends up having a series of adventures with all of the sisters. So there is a faint nod to Little Women by Louisa May Alcott. So if you're a fan of Little Women, I do think you will appreciate the plot of this book. That being said, I just didn't really love the kids in this book. I thought they were just too precocious, too cutesy, just, you know, too sweet, like sickening sweet a little bit. And I really wasn't buying it. Um, the older sister, she's only 12, but she is kind of mothers the other girls. And she's in love with this older gardener who's about 18. And she just feels like she's 16, like she's not 12. So I wasn't really buying the older sister. Um, the second oldest sister, Skye, was just a little annoying. I didn't really love Skye. And the two younger sisters, it just kind of precocious and annoying. So I feel bad. I wanted to continue with this series, but I'm just gonna stop here. I do recommend it. It's very similar to the Vanderbeekers. So I think if you like the Vanderbeekers, you will like the Penderwicks. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna stop here and I gave this book three out of five stars. Another book that I read this month, which I mentioned in my mid-year freakout tag, was Amelia Unabridged by Ashley Schumacher. This was mentioned in that tag because it is a new book that just came out this year in the YA genre, and I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a lot of fun. Ashley Schumacher is a debut author, and I thought she did a terrific job with this book. It's basically a very heartfelt, very emotional book. It's about a young woman named Amelia. She's 18, just graduated from high school and her best fr friend has died tragically in a car accident so it's very emotional it's about her dealing with the loss of her best friend that's mainly what it is about and both of the girls they loved this fantasy series called the Ormond Chronicles and after her friend dies, she gets a first edition leather bound copy of the Ormond Chronicles in the mail. And Amelia just kind of convinces herself that it's her friend, it's Jenna. She's sending her this book from beyond the grave. And so in order to process her feelings and all this grief, she ends up going to the bookstore and tracking down where the book came from. And it comes from this tiny little bookstore 
in Michigan. And so I don't want to give away anything else because that's where I'll leave it. But it's such a great, sweet story, great coming of age story, great romance, and it's just a lot of fun. It is very emotional. The main premise of this book is about teenagers dealing with loss dealing with grief. So if you don't want to hear a lot of moaning and groaning and whining, I think you should probably steer clear of this book, but it was well done. Ashley Schumacher's writing is very lyrical, very beautiful. And like most new authors, I mean, some of her sentences were very beautiful, very profound, and some of them just didn't make sense at all. So, but in general, I think she did a good job. My favorite thing about this book is that it does talk about how books help you get through emotional pain. And I myself have certainly used books as a form of therapy. I'm sure a lot of you on BookTube do the same thing. So I think if you do that, if you use books as a form of therapy, you will probably really enjoy this book as much as I did. And she also talks about that feeling in life, you know, when you're in so much emotional pain that you can't even read, that books can't even save you anymore. I mean, I know I've been there a few times in my life where I've been so sad, I couldn't even pick up a book. And, uh, but it's just interesting to see how Amelia works through that. Really love this book. I gave it four out of five stars. It did remind me of a book I wanted to mention that I read a few years ago called Among Others by Joe Walton. That was also a really fantastic book. In a lot of ways, I liked it a little more than Amelia Unabridged. It's also about a young teenager going to boarding school in England, I think, and she's dealing with some loss and some grief. And it has a little bit of like fantasy elements to it too. It's very interesting. And she also uses books as a form of therapy and solace. So if you like Amelia Unabridged, I do recommend Among Others as well. Both are fantastic books. All right, in this next half of the video, I will discuss my Jane Austen July wrap up. So I made several videos about Jane Austen July, which I'll link below. It was so much fun this year, taking a deep dive into Jane Austen's work, books inspired by Jane Austen, and even some biographies about Jane Austen, which I really, really enjoyed. And I, yeah, what can you say? I love her. I will always love Jane Austen. So the first book that I did read was The Other Bennett Sister by Janice Hadlow. I mentioned this in the Jane Austen July TBR. I was starting it at that time and I did enjoy this. I really, really loved it. I wanna reiterate yet again what a terrific writer Janice Hadlow is. I really appreciated how she wrote in Jane Austen's style. So she really attempted to write in the same cadence, the same language as Jane Austen, which I absolutely adored. And it was nice to hear uh, Mary Bennett's versions of events. So this is basically a retelling of Pride and Prejudice through the eyes of Mary Bennett. And then it goes beyond Pride and Prejudice. So after Pride and Prejudice ends, it tells you the rest of Mary Bennett's history. And I absolutely loved it. I think it is just really a win for all of us introverted bookish girls that wear glasses, especially. Um, I don't wear glasses in my videos, but I wear glasses about 90% of the time. So um, yeah, I just love those scenes where she gets her first pair of glasses. And um, yeah, she loves to read. She's studying Greek. And so it's just a real homage to all of us girls that love books. And you will also think about some characters from Pride and Prejudice a little differently when you read this book, especially Mr. Collins and Charlotte Lucas. I really thought those chapters were very, very interesting. Um, I now kind of like Mr. Collins just a little bit more than I did. And Charlotte Lucas is kind of, you know, a little bit of a dark horse, like I always thought. And I also really enjoyed the scenes where she goes to stay with Elizabeth and Darcy at Pemberley. And it's interesting to see because Elizabeth and Darcy's relationship from an outsider's perspective would be a little nauseating, would be a little exhausting. I think we all have to admit that. And just they are so enamored with each other that I can see how Mary felt like an outsider. So I like those scenes a lot. Also, I don't want to give away too many spoilers, but I do like the scenes in London where she goes and stays with her aunt and uncle, the gardeners. So if you liked the gardeners in Pride and Prejudice, I'm just telling you right now, I like them 100% more after I read this book. The gardeners are absolutely the best. I gave this four out of five stars. I thought for a moment I was going to give it five out of five stars, but it is very slow. A lot of people complain that the pace of this book is just too slow. 
it didn't bother me that much. I think the ending, like the last third of the book was very slow, um, but I enjoyed it. But yeah, I took it down a star because of the, the pace of this book. In fact, reading this with Jane Austen at the same time, Jane Austen was a little quicker in pace than Janice Hadlow. So I'm just gonna put that out there as well. I loved this book and I gave it four out of five stars. The next book that I read was Jane Austen at Home by Lucy Worsley. I mentioned this as well on my TBR video. Lucy Worsley, again, is a very famous British historian. She makes documentaries on BBC and PBS, and she did do a documentary about this book, and I will link it below again if you'd like to see it because it's really fascinating. However, I am so glad that I did go back and read the source material. I actually read the book. It was so good. I feel like I understand Jane Austen. She feels like a real person to me now, thanks to this book, like a real woman that I can relate to. And she did, she just had a fascinating life. That's what I realized, that Jane Austen wasn't just this little spinster writing these books in the countryside. That no, she had a very interesting life. She lived all over England, and that's what this book is about. It's just all the homes that Jane Austen lived and all the places that she lived. And once you read about her experiences in Bath, in Lyme Regis, at you know the fancy estate of her brother, at Steventon Rectory, you just have an appreciation now of all of her novels because she did what they always tell writers to do. She wrote based on what she knew, based on the experiences that she had in real life. And she did get out. I mean, I think a lot of us assume that she was just a little old maid, that she never met anybody and died an old maid. But now having read this, I know that she chose that by choice, that Jane Austen chose to remain single by choice, um, that she had plenty of opportunity to get married. She was very romantic. Many men were in love with her. She was given a few marriage proposals, but she also, at the same time, she watched two of her sister-in-laws die in childbirth. And so I agree with Lucy Worsley's theory in this is that she basically chose to write books instead of have babies. And you know, that's a choice. That's a choice that modern women are more free to make, but still, it's still, um, an issue for modern women as well. So I really enjoyed that. I enjoyed the ex learning about how Jane Austen negotiated on her books. I didn't realize that Jane Austen actually got to experience some fame as a writer in her own time. I just always assumed that her books didn't become popular until after she died. And that's certainly true. She didn't become as popular as she is today in her lifetime, but she certainly experienced some success. And that just makes me so happy knowing that she knew that Pride and Prejudice was a success. She knew that Emma was a success. And so I really love those scenes in London where she's with her brother and she's negotiating the contract and the royalties on Emma. I really, really enjoyed that as well. So fantastic book. If you wanna learn more about Jane Austen as a person, I highly recommend this book. The next book that I read also by Lucy Worsley was The Austen Girls. And I was so excited to read this book. Look at that cover. It's basically about Jane Austen's real life nieces, Fanny and Anna. And Anna was the daughter of her brother, James, who lived at Steventon Rectory. And then Fanny was the daughter of her very wealthy brother, Edward, who lived at Godmersham Park with a very fancy estate that inspired, you know, Mansfield Park and Pemberley and all these places. And, you know, I just thought this was gonna be more interesting than it actually was. This book was such a huge disappointment. And in a way, I'm kind of happy. It's nice to know that Lucy Worsley isn't perfect at everything because she is so smart, she is so gifted, but I really think she should just stick to history and biography because to be honest, her fiction writing is not the best. So this is a YA historical fiction novel about Jane Austen's two nieces. Jane Austen doesn't make an appearance in this and in certain respects, it's fun. There's some moments where Jane Austen and Fanny kind of have like a Nancy Drew mystery that they're trying to solve. but. Just when in terms of romance, I thought it was gonna be a little more romantic. I thought it was going to be about Fanny and Anna having these different romances and going to balls and parties and having to decide if they wanted to get married or remain single women. And it is about that, but 
it's just so boring. I mean, I think it could have been a little more interesting. And it was interesting reading this alongside of Jane at home because Lucy Worsley did base a lot of this book off of real life events that happened in Jane Austen's own life and to her family. So I appreciated the historical accuracy of this book, which we all know Lucy Worsley is good at, but the writing, mm, not so much. So I gave this book, I'm gonna be generous and give it three out of five stars, but not my favorite. And the last book that I read this month was Persuasion by Jane Austen. And I really feel like I don't need to get too much into Persuasion. I mentioned it at length in my Jane Austen ranking video, which I will link below. So if you wanna find out my thoughts about Persuasion, please go back and watch that video. But again, it was just wonderful to reread a classic this year, especially by Jane Austen. And I did read the Karen Savage audiobook of this, so I listened to Karen Savage's narration. She's one of my favorite audiobook narrators, and she just did a fantastic job with this book. However, before I end, I have decided to do something a little new on this channel, and that is make Spotify playlists based on all my favorite classic books. So every month at the end in my wrap up, I am going to announce a different classic book that I have made a Spotify playlist for. And so I did, I made my first playlist for Persuasion and I will link that below. It was so much fun to find all of these songs that relate to Persuasion. I just had a blast making that playlist. I hope that you check it out and enjoy it as much as I enjoyed making it because this is such a beautiful romantic book and there sure are a number of romantic songs in the world. So check out that link below of my new Spotify playlist of Persuasion. Thank you everyone for joining me for my July wrap up. I loved all of these books, cannot recommend them highly enough. I do encourage you to go back and reread or pick up for the first time Animal Farm. Now is the moment to read Animal Farm. And that's why I'm a reader because I think through fiction, through literature, we can learn so much about ourselves and the society that we live in. Thank you everyone and have a great day.